So hello, this is the data science incubator on how to improve the way we manage and use data. And uh, today uh, is the first meeting after you know, the first discussion where we kind of, uh, I think we came to, uh, to agree that, uh, that we are all happy to try to kind of improve how we do this. Uh, so it, how we get there is not so clear, but I think um, you know your comments in the collaborative documents that we wrote last time did help me uh, kind of lay out some points of you know what are the requirements that we would like to have in a system that is better than what we have right now. So in the issue uh, associated to the meetup today, which is the data science incubator issue number thirty-eight, I lay out seven points that I came up with, uh, and you know. I, if you, if you can think of any uh, any more points, uh, go ahead and, and let me know. You don't have to do it now. I'm just uh, pointing you to that resource there. So I think that a good system to manage our data would, for example, allow us to control the permissions uh, for different people to read or write data. It could you know, support version control, ideally with GitHub, because those are tools that we already use, so we, do, we wouldn't need to learn anything new. Uh, also, it would uh, allow us to host the data online, but also be able to kind of reach those data sets locally as well, in case you know, we don't have an internet connection or uh, whatever. Uh, also, to kind of avoid downloading data all the time. Uh, also, it would allow to us to you know, access data sets that are of the size that we normally use, so large data sets sometimes. Uh, it would play well with R and Python because those are the tools that our team uh, works with, mostly R. Uh, it would be free ideally or maybe low cost and it would implement tools that we are already familiar, like GitHub, for example. Uh, if later you come up with ideas, feel free to put them um, on this issue, issue 38 of the Data Science Inquiry. So what I, you know, I, I to educate myself for this, uh, uh, meetup, I, I um, explored the PINs package, which is one of the potential many ways to get better at managing and using data. So I really liked it. It kind of was one of those things that they just work. It's hosted by our studio and developed by someone I know is, is a very good developer. So I, I recorded a little demo that I think I would like to play because I think I will keep more on time if I just play a video <laughs> than if I continue to talk. Before uh, I show you that, uh, do we have any any comments or questions here? Um, maybe just to confirm, this is an option for us to sort of access and store data on GitHub, and then for use in different projects. And this Correct. is one of potential option. One of the potential options yeah. to access data across many platforms. So one could be GitHub, but uh, for example, this Teams package plays well with also with Azure. It plays well with um, data sets stored in packages. So it has a bunch of what they call boards, which are places yeah. where you can get data from. And GitHub could be one. So you know, my, my motivation was to try you know, to start with pins, was to, to start with a minimum layer on top of what we already have that would get us uh, you know, closer to our goal. Um, one thing that I would add to this list of important things is, whether or not the size of file that we intend to have is possible in there. And so this would be a question for me putting data into GitHub because they have like file size limits and I don't know if the data that we have is um, going to be bigger than that or not. So that would be a critical kind of. So what is the maximum size of data we need to host in, in our organization? Yeah, or something like in terms of the critical characteristics are able to able to host the size of data that we intend to Perfect. Yeah. Uh, um, yes. I'll, I'll just throw out here that Azure um, Blob Storage mm -hmm. does not have um, an upper limit on file size. Um, if we are using the um, OneDrive integration with it, that limits us to a 15 gigabyte file. So. Um, it, if a particular file needs to be above 15 gig, we need to be thinking about that. Um, but on the other hand, since this is in our package, when you open it, it'll get read into memory, which is problematic in its own way. Mm. I would also like to add, like Mauro, just I'll take like one. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, please. 
in the AWS also like uh, you can save the data directly into the RDS format and it also doesn't like, upper size limit. Most of the time like uh, let's say if we have like uh, tens of different of like uh, RDS files but we know it's like uh, from one project then it would be like a listed data frame that we put it into like one RDS file which would be like a just object which contains like a several different data frame and then we can access it. Right? That is also one option. Perfect. Okay, we, I would like to hear more about that and, and um, the details probably in a dedicated meetup uh, on Azure, um, which you know, I think we are already thinking about that. We have a meeting planned for Thursday with uh, people on the, uh, you know, on the side of software development and people on the side of databases. So hopefully we will all kind of learn more and have something to share uh, publicly here on a, on a meetup. Uh, so okay, probably we will have more questions once we sh uh, show you what the pins package can do. So let me see if I can play this thing. Can you hear the video too? I pause no, it there. Can no, you hear no, no. the noise or, uh, or it's just yeah. the image? Just the image. Just the image. Mm, I don't know how you did it last time. Okay, then I will just go with the demo uh, myself. So I already mentioned where to find the package. It's uh, on the pins.rstudio.com, basically. Uh, you can Google it, it's easy to find. Um, and uh, let me show you then a live demo. So I'm gonna jump to our studio. Uh, the setup is, is straightforward, it's as usual, installing a package. Uh, nothing new. So I did install the, its version from CRAN. So if I attach the package and call package version, I can show you that uh, it is version uh, 0.4.0. .0. Can you confirm that you see, let me clean my console. Can you confirm that you see my RStudio console here? Yeah. Yeah. So that's about it for setup, just installing an R package. Uh, I also attach here a tidyverse because uh, I will use a couple of functions from there, but it's not compulsory at all. So you may already know, that, or maybe not, that uh, functions like read.csv or read underscore CSV uh, allow you to read data directly from an online source. So imagine I have a, a URL that could be pointing to a data set on GitHub or whatever. In this case, it's pointing to something on, on Facebook. I could, I could uh, you know, store that URL uh, on, uh, on a variable, like I'm doing here in the variable URL. And then I could pass it to read underscore CSV or read dot CSV. And it will just, you know, get the data from, from its online resource and, uh, and store it in wherever I want to store it. So I can now, you know, have a look at the head of that uh, data set. And this is what it looks like. But the problem is, as we discussed before, that, you know, what happens if you don't have an internet connection? Uh, and also what happens if the data set is very large, you don't want to kind of read, read the data all the time and, and rely on your internet for that. So PINs data, PINs, you know, solves that problem by um, um, creating a cache of uh, any resource that you pin. So simply you just wrap now the URL in PIN and then, uh, the package will do all the magic behind the hood. So for you, the experience doesn't change. You just, you know, do the same thing you would normally do. I call the head of the object and it's there. But then a uh, pin saves some metadata. So if I use the function pin underscore info, uh, I can show you here that, you know, the, the package knows something about this resource that was kind of stored locally. Um, and uh, and that is, that's the magic. So it kind of abstracts where things are said. You don't really care about that. Pins takes care of it. And it will only download the, uh, the, the remote source if it detects that it has changed. If it doesn't detect that it has changed, it will just you know, get you the output from its local cache, which saves you a lot of time and um, the pain to download things from the internet. Um, so that's one cool thing. Let me collapse this so we move on. Uh, the next section I wanted to talk is, well, okay, now say that we have created this, or we have a data set, whatever that is, like in this case, I'm reusing the one I showed you just before, and we compute something on it. So imagine that you have a very long computation that takes you know, hours to compute, and then you want to create a cache for that as well. Pin can help you with it. So 
if you computed an object, so uh, this pipeline modifies the original object in a meaningful way to you, maybe it took a long time to run. And then, so this is what it would look like if I run the pipeline. And then you want to save this in a cache locally, and then you can do pin uh, and a new name. So you, you create a name for this modified version of, of your file or your data set, uh, and pin will you know, use that name and create some metadata so that you can access it later on. So now if I do pin info, on the new name of the modified object, as you can see, it has information about it. You know how many rows it has, how many columns, and so on and so forth. So how would you go about using that data later on in your workflow? Yeah, just with the function pin get and the name that you just get, gave to this object, it will retrieve it from your cache, so you don't need to rerun the whole pipeline. So that's the uh, second cool thing that uh, pin could do for us. Um, Another thing that is cool is that you know it has this thing called boards, which are just spaces where you can search for um, pins, um, data sets, or any kind of object that you create in R and you store. Uh, so one of the many boards are packages. Another board is GitHub. Another board is Azure. Another board is uh, Kaggle. There is a bunch of places that you can ask Pin to look for information. And uh, the function pin find, for example, takes a string. Uh, that will be matched not only in the name of the resource, but also in the description of the resource. So if I run pin find in the board packages, I think it will look in the, in the database of cram packages and we'll try to find the string flight. So for example, in the many um, places, it is matching you know, here, it is matching he here, and it's also matching here. So the resource that I'm interested in right now, let's just suppose it is, let me expand this a little bit, I think. Let's assume that I want to access, okay, this is the data set that I want. I live in Houston, I want to know flights uh, in Houston uh, airport. So uh, I'm gonna use that. Uh, first, I want to show you to prove that I don't have the package installed. So the way you read the information that we just got, is this is just data frame, is, uh, you know, it has like a format owner uh, repository. So the uh, package name actually and the data set name. Uh, for example, here the package is NC Flights 13 and there is a data set that's called Flights. Uh, but I'm interested in this one resource, for example, right? So if I want to use it, then I would need to do something like this line 48. Uh, but before I do that, I want to prove that I don't have the package installed. So if I call the, the, the function package version on the package H flights, if I try that, it will fail. It creates an error because I don't have it installed. And yet I can use data set from that uh, package by calling ping get the format, you know, owner uh, repo and the board packages. So with that, uh, the resource now, you know, is, is uh, coming now into my R environment. Um, what else I wanted to show you? I guess I could create an object here. That would be more natural. So I can recall, yeah, I can call X and store it in a, in a variable here. Again, you know, it also creates metadata. There is a description, there is some information that things knows about this resource. And finally, and what I think is more exciting for us as a community that uses GitHub, is this idea that you can create a repo and, and use it as a place to store data as it was, you know, um, yeah, just like a, a data store, right? So uh, I, I, that's what something I want to kind of demonstrate. I did it already, uh, but let me show you how it works again from scratch. So basically, you go to GitHub, you create a new repository. Uh, let's call it um, demo pin, pins three. I already did two practice runs on this. Uh, and I'm gonna initialize this with a little readme, create repository. That's all I need to do on the side of GitHub. The repo is now empty. As you can see, it just has a readme file. But uh, I can now go to our studio and uh, add that. So that's the, the step that I just done, right? Create a repo. And now I can register that as a board that I want to use. So the board uh, you know, takes a repo argument. Uh, so I need to use the function, sorry, board register GitHub. It has a repo argument, uh, the repo, lives in my account, my repo, it could be to do investing if we wanted. And the repo uh, that I'm gonna use now is the one that I just created. It's uh, 
demo dash pins three. Uh, and it also takes a token because it needs to kind of be able to talk to GitHub, right? And to write stuff to GitHub. So, you know, I'm gonna pass it my private token. So I'm gonna use, I'm not gonna print it here. I'm just gonna use the function, use this GitHub token. So just by writing this function, I'm registering that repository as a place where I can store stuff. Uh, and let's see which data sets uh, we have. So let's, air quality. Let's see, I want to register air quality data set. So I'm gonna call the function pins on air quality, air, uh, air uh, data sets, air quality. Yeah, this is the data set that I want, air quality. Uh, and a little description, the air quality data set. And I'm telling PIN to register, to store it on uh, the board GitHub. So I run now this function I, uh, and it kind of runs successfully. So what happens if I now go to GitHub? Uh, if I refresh this page, you can see that the, there is a new folder there called air quality. And if you, you go inside it, you see a CSV, an RDS, and a text file. I'm not familiar with the data structure of, of this package. But that's the magic. So it, it, that information is all uh, done by pins. So now locally, I can refer to that um, register, that board GitHub, and use that resource just by calling pin get again. So let me edit this because it was for a previous run. So now with pin get, I'm giving the name of the data set that I have stored and the board that I want to use. I can you can see how you know the data set is now available. So you will again download it from GitHub or use the local cache if it already has it. And that's about it. Uh, it's very short uh, demo. The package does a bunch of other things, but I think this is from my reading about two hours I spent on this. Uh, it looks uh, pretty promising. So I would like to kind of hear your thoughts about how you see this as a potential uh, solution or what flaws you see and what things you would like that this would have. I like the GitHub board, that option where you can push the data frame and then after you get it. But uh, is it also possible to work uh, with the private repositories? I think so. I haven't tried it myself, but I'm, uh, I think so. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know a lot. You know, I'm trying to educate okay. quickly and I don't want to invest a lot until we kind of a okay. resource sounds promising for everyone. But I'm pretty sure it does. Because you know, I have to give it the, the GitHub token, you give permission okay. to, to write to, you, you can, you know, mm -hmm. you create a token, you can create a token that has scope for private repos. So I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure it's good. I can research more on that. Okay. Where does the cache exist? Like where, where is the, yeah, where's yeah. the cache get written to? I don't know yet. Uh, that's another question. Let me add those notes to the GitHub issue. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's cool eh, to know how, uh, Questions. Yeah. I, when I was looking into this a while ago, like years ago, it was writing to Temp Cloud and it changed since then. Can you say again? Sorry, I couldn't hear because of my own typing. Oh, when I was looking at this package a couple of years ago, they were writing it to a temp file. They may have changed since then. Mm. Oh, so it's destroyed after your session? The, um, I, I think it gets destroyed as normal temp file cleanup. So whatever your operating system preferences are. I'm going to try. I mean, I'm going to restart my session here uh, and go to the end here. Um, so now my session is, so if I call... Uh, so I, I guess I should do library pins and then pin get GitHub board not available. Blah, blah. I think I have to register first. So GitHub register. I think this is register GitHub. Um, okay. your... Yeah, and that works. So you oh, attach the package and register the re the board. Yeah. Okay. Also, there is this, this connections tab on our studio that is integrated for pins, as you can see here. 
Um, it works with some resources, not all. Um, and I haven't explored it myself, but in the vignette of the package, it says how you can use it, maybe with our Studio Connect. There's, you know, shiny apps, and there's a lot of things built on top of this. Uh, fine I've, things. So would that mean that if I don't have any internet and I didn't load it beforehand into my R, like I wouldn't be able to assess the data, assess the data, right? Um, my understanding is that the cache, the cache lives locally, and if the resource disappears, you should still be able to get it from there. Um, so let me see what happens. So I honestly, you know, this is just some you know good questions to look, store here. So let me add it first here. Uh, edit. What happens if I don't have internet? Okay, so let's try kill the repo. I'm gonna destroy this repository. Um, so I have to say here, yeah. Oof. It's not that easy for me, ah, there you go. Uh, okay, so that repo is gone, and what happens if I now restart my session? Restarting R. Where is my console? Here it is. And now attach pins, register the board. It looks like the repo doesn't exist, which is fair enough. What happens is I get it. GitHub board not available, boards, total packages. Yeah, so it looks like if, if the thing doesn't is go is gone, it doesn't get it. But I, I'm pretty sure I read that it, it had a way to get around that. So I need to learn more and probably answer that question there. One really cool thing that I didn't show is that it has versions. So if you overwrite the data, um, you can create a new version. So you can you know see a list of all the possible versions and uh, and get data that you know existed before. Uh, let me see here on versioning on the website. So basically what you get is for each data set, you know, all these are the same data set, but with these different, you know, versions. Uh, so that kind of plays really well with Git and GitHub. Um, so my comment is that this is a cool, like, interface, but it doesn't really resolve the issue about like, where do we actually store the data? So looking at the web, it's homepage, it says, um, you know, this can use GitHub or S3 or local file cache or Dropbox or blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a cool, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it has, it's interesting and cool, but I'm not sure it really addresses the key question of like, where do we want to end up storing our data long term? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good point because, you know, the, I think that I like that this, this tool is kind of integrated with many services. So uh, that this, for example, if you like or not this resource, it doesn't mean that we still cannot move, say, to Azure, you know. So um, I think it's just a, like a, a convenient way to, uh, yeah, to make just a little tiny step you know, in the direction we want to go with a relatively small effort in, in the near tool. But, you know, I ha we have to try it, uh, honestly. Yeah. Um, and if we store stuff, uh, say GitHub or Azure or you know, S3, whatever, we still need to find a way to get it into R, right? So yeah. I think this could be that interface maybe. But as yeah. you say, you know, it, does, it doesn't solve the problem of, it doesn't decide for us where we want to store it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in general, this idea of memoization is is cool, and that could be the critical piece in between. So, if we store the data like in this centrally cloud-based thing, whether it's Azure, S3, or whatever, and then we're accessing the files locally, then if there's some sort of process like this of memoizing those things and storing a, a hidden but local cache, 
and what Klaus um, mentioned, maybe this would be possible. So like you can work on your work, but because you've um, used, because you've accessed this file before, then when you're on the train and you don't have internet access, there's still like a local cache somewhere on your hard drive and something like pins or the memoized package, or there's a few other memoization packages. Um, they could maybe transparently enable you to access that data, whether it's using your local cache or it's actually pulling it from the, the cloud-based um, like, you know, primary or so source of the data or something. So it's, it's cool in that sense. We are three minutes from, from a total deadline, but if we can end earlier, better. Um, so if you have a burning question, uh, go ahead now, or otherwise, you know, feel free to add comments to this issue. And I will try to digest this conversation and you know, we will accumulate in, in the next few um, meetups. Uh, you know, the idea is to get in our brains as many possible alternatives as, possible as we can. And then you know, we will have more information to make a better decision, hopefully. Can you maybe directly start with preparing an overview in a table format somehow that you have like, this is the, those are the requirements, this is the option that those are met sure, and sure, maybe sure. there's limitations or something. So that, that makes it much easier at the end to take a decision. I mean, especially thinking about if we want to move to something else, then Dropbox, we obviously have to ask um, Jacob. Uh, and I know that we just want to move the data work, but still we probably need some permission, especially if it costs. Okay, I think I have to say thank you very much. It's now 9.29 uh, uh, here and uh, 4.29 there. And the next meeting is about to start. So thanks for joining. <laughs> no, that was good. Thanks, Mario.